I'd like to introduce you to Thomas Koch from BCT, uh, based in Dortmund. Let's talk a little bit about the work we've done <coughs> within the AMAZE project on automated post-processing. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. If you look into um, newspapers today, sorry, it's central. Oh, yeah, you've got it. we're videoing you. OK. If you look to the newspapers today, you will find some articles about additive manufacturing. And if you read them, you can get the impression that after finishing the build, everything is fine and you can use the part directly. I can tell you this is not the truth. Some additional processes are required to prepare the part, to finish it, and to make it usable in all the applications. And all these steps um, following the build process are named in the AMAZE project as post-processing. And this is what I'm talking about in the next couple of minutes. There are several different objectives guiding the work of the project. Heaping has to be developed. New heat treatment uh, strategies have to be investigated and uh, a work group was concentrating on additive and adaptive machining and fast fixturings. And on top of this, we have developed a new surface treatment strategy as well. Hipping and heat treatment have been discussed this morning by David in his slides, and so I do not want to repeat them. And I would like to concentrate on these things listed here on this slide. Post-processing, in our understanding, is at first to remove all these remaining support elements which might be necessary during the build. We have to integrate fittings. We have to integrate bearing seats. We have to prepare functional surfaces as interfaces to other parts. And of course, sometimes the parts require to increase or improve the overall surface structure, which means to make the parts more shiny reduce the surface roughness. With these topics, we are dealing in the uh, AMAZE project in the group I'm representing here. In the olden days, okay. in the olden days, I don't want to stick here in, in the, under this box. Um, in the olden days, everything seems to be better. The parts have reduced complexity. They were bulky. They were stiff enough. They did not have, uh, let me say, bionic-looking structures. Um, they had a huge amount of stock material all over. There were no um, support elements spread over the part. And for the fixture maker, the life was much easier. But the new freedom of this additive manufacturing process introduces some challenges for the post-processing team or for the fixture maker. He has to deal with exactly these things. He has to deal with the small filigree elements. He has to deal with bionic-like uh, shaped uh, structures. We have seen uh, the sun sensor support this morning. And he has to provide a reliable fixture to support mechanical post-processing um, in a cost-effective way. And uh, these are some issues uh, which have to be taken into consideration. To give uh, the introduction, um, I have to uh, name some requirements set up by the part owners. And the part owners wanted to have a lightweight part. They do not want to edit some features which might have uh, been, um, or which could have been used for aligning the part in the later fixture. They want to have the part with a priority <coughs> design for use. They want to have it light. They want to have it optimized. They want to have it, yeah, designed for use and not the design <coughs> for production. And this is a little bit um, a strange situation. On the one hand side, the additive manufacturing offers a huge flexibility. You can produce whatever you want. You can see the foam-like structures uh, produced by Renishaw over there. 
you can see the bionic structures uh, optimized and produced by the powder bed systems. But on the other hand side, on, from the perspective of fixture maker, this may be an issue to handle these filigree parts to support the parts where supports are needed. And uh, I think uh, one has to find a, a trade-off, a balance between these both concepts, design for use and design for production. I think, as often in life, the, the truth is in the middle. Due to the limited time, I'm only avail, uh, able to show you some minor or some small um, extracts out of the work done here at the MTC. This is the part uh, used for uh, this is the antenna support and uh, the orange arrows on the right hand side indicate where this part needs some post-processing. Post-processing in this sense means milling, drilling, producing these cutouts and some other operations. What you can see here that all these uh, manufacturing tasks are spread over the part. And so we decided uh, to design a fixture in a way that uh, all these manufacturing tasks can be handled in one single clamping operation. Of course, using a five axis milling machine to reorient the part to the proper solution, uh, to the proper orientations. Drillings are required uh, on the feed area. And as <coughs> mentioned before, cutouts are necessary on these very, very thin elements on top and uh, this was one concept introduced here inside the project. What we have learned so far is uh, that uh, these additive <coughs> manufacturers part um, sometimes look different. If you use different processes you may have different uh, geometrical um, changes, different shapes in, in minor millimeter area, but it is a good idea to have uh, a fixture design which is flexible enough to cover these part-to-part -part deviations. And therefore, for example, the MTC team introduced uh, this blue slider which is able to, so that the operator is able to handle <coughs> the individual part in, in a proper way. It's not a good idea to design the, the fixture in a too stiff manner, in an unflexible manner, because you will run into problems uh, later on during the, the processing. They have locating phases here integrated. They have uh, special clamping um, systems investigated uh, to clamp the feed area. And uh, this fixture has then been produced by the MTC. And this is the, the fixture as it was used for producing the part, which you can see behind this wall. You can see that uh, some cutouts provide uh, access to uh, the part on the lower area. And what you can see as well is that there are some, there are some supporting elements and um, not to, or to support the, the very thin flat areas on top of the part because we were not quite sure if uh, the optimizing guy took these process forces into consideration during his optimizing process. And so we were afraid to destroy the part just due to the milling forces introduced by the milling process. And this is why we added these supporting elements at the specific areas. What I've mentioned uh, so far can be uh, named as the normal, as the standard additive manufacturing route. Based on the CAT model, on an optimized CAT model, the operator is able to prepare the, the additive manufacturing program, which is here called uh, AM preparation. It will lead to a build file. The build file will be used for the, for the additive manufacturing build process without problems. At the end, if the part comes out of the machine, hipping and heat treatment uh, systems will be used, or processes will be used. But what we have seen here in the project, we have a significant amount of deformations of the part. Deformations are not critical. 
but for the from the post-processing perspective, they are leading to a huge amount of stock material which have to be left on all the surfaces which have to be processed. So if you're not quite sure how precise your process is, it's better to leave a little bit more stock material on your functional surfaces than running into problems at the end of the process chain. This is the standard route, the standard process chain. Within a maze, we investigated two different approaches which can be used alone or complementary. One is uh, to use the simulation, which is uh, explained in another session this afternoon, to predict the deformations of the part. If you can be sure in a certain range, if you know which deformations are expected, then it might be easier to reduce the amount of stock material at the interface sections, which makes the build quicker and which supports the post-processing of the part as well. So it is beneficial from both perspectives. Another thing which could be used is uh, you can use so-called adaptive machining uh, approach to handle parts with a little bit varying shape. What's adaptive machining? I would like to start with a short disambiguation because sometimes these uh, both terms, best fit and adaptation, are mixed uh, in a chaotic way. Best fit means you have the situation here shown in, in gray. This is the planned situation. You want to produce the cylinder and you want to mill it a little bit on, on top area. But what you find on the machine is the cylinder has the proper shape, everything is fine, but it is located not where you expected it. Maybe your fixture is too weak, maybe there are some clamping errors, whatever, but you have to deal with this uh, problem. This can easily be handled by integrated measuring systems. The measuring will detect the deviation in shape or in, in position, and then you can adjust the, the entire NC program. Uh, things get even worse if not only the position of the part inside the machine changes, but also its shape. Then it is not sufficient anymore to use the standard NC program just in another orientation. You have to adjust each and every single point of the NC program so that it matches the final or the situation found inside the machine. And this is what we called adaptation. To bring all this information together, we developed a so-called adaptive machining program. The, the brand name of company BCT here is Open Arms. And you can see this element as a combining element sitting in the middle, combining the well-defined CAT model world, the, and the CAM world, defining the NC programs, where everything is defined and everything is fine and the real world, shown here in orange, where we have to take care about the individual shape of the parts. All the information um, are combined in the, in the system. The system is connected to the NC machine. The system is connected to uh, sensors, maybe tactile, maybe laser line scanners, as shown by Stuart before, to capture the SS situation. And at the end of the adaptation process, you will get what we have called here in this slide the NC program star, which means each and every part will have its own NC program that can be sent to the machine and which can be handled in the same way like a serial production. So if all the process steps here, the, the calculation steps, have been set up once, you do not have to ca take care about part-to-part -part deviations imprecise clamping systems and whatever. It is all handled by the system. And we use this uh, here in the scope of a maze, just giving a, a short introduction or flavor how it looks like. You see on the graphical area the part representation. In orange I've marked uh, the areas uh, which have to be processed. 
All these steps are integrated in a so-called project tree so that the user is able to integrate new NC programs, uh, whatever he likes, uh, to the tree. And uh, the process is running in the order defined in the, in the process tree as well. As mentioned before, the system is connected to the machine, and so it's able to handle the entire, let me say, post-processing process automatically. Sometimes users are a little bit nervous and, and that everything uh, runs smoothly and everything is fine, and so the system provides a graphical representation or a graphical feedback to show the planned situation here in gray and the situation found on the machine here shown in yellow color so that the user can, can be sure that the calculation will do what it, he is, expects. Therefore, we use the integrated measuring system integrated into the machine. We uh, improved uh, our best fit um, algorithms inside the software so that now the algorithms can be properly adjusted to the flexibility or to the degrees of freedom offered by the fixture. And this was tested using another test piece you can also see in the display in the other room. These are some process steps. I will not go into the details. You see that this uh, part has to be processed in different orientations using different uh, tools and uh, everything um, has been handled inside the fixture and inside the software. In which cases this adaptive approach can help? It can help if you would like to use a cheap fixture design. If you would like to reduce the requirements for the precision of the fixture because the overall position of the part is not so interesting if you are able to measure it. The software system can also be used if you are expecting shape to uh, part to part variations in shape. They can also be captured and taken into consideration during the NC process. And uh, so this uh, technology can be seen as an add-on to the post-processing and can help to overcome some issues presented here by these complex additive manufactured parts. Another uh, topic uh, this work package team has dealt with is uh, improvement of the overall surface finishing. If you see some parts, especially coming out of the um, electron beam machines, they are quite rough and they need some special surface treatment, not to get them make them shiny, but to reduce the overall surface roughness. Normally, there are some uh, processes available using special chemicals or electron systems, but uh, this group here, led by the ILT, um, investigated a process <coughs> called laser polishing, which uses the laser itself as a polishing instrument. And the idea is to remelt a small layer of the part and to use the surface tension to reduce the overall roughness of the part. And uh, the requirement is no additional materials should be used. It should run automatically. And of course, the process should not destroy or, uh, or weaken the overall mechanical properties of the part. A nice shiny part with weak mechanical properties is not worth anything. And so this is an interesting topic of the work done here. Let's start with the end. You can see on the display over there that uh, the process is running. ILT has developed a two-step process. In the first step, the overall roughness is reduced with a 400 watt laser with a relatively big um, point of uh, laser point. And uh, to improve the, the glossiness of the part, they add 
an other process which uses only a small laser, only 250 micron diameter with 60 watts to get the, the element more shiny. With this uh, two-step approach, it was, uh, it was possible to reduce the overall roughness from around 50 micrometers at the beginning to 0 0.3, which is around 98% reduction in roughness. To give you a flavor what uh, these 0 0.9 centimeters, uh, square centimeters per second mean, they mean that you can polish such a surface, such an area, in less than two hours, fully automatically. And so this uh, process, I think, it's, uh, it's a good way to use the laser also not for building the part, but also for post-processing the part. The result is quite nice, but uh, the way to uh, it was quite long and hard. Because uh, polishing a flat surface, you can imagine if the, if the laser hits the part uh, in a perpendicular way, um, you have a circular um, area of uh, activities. But if you have curved parts, this circle will be deformed, it will become an ellipsis or whatever, depending on the curvature. So if you always use the same set of parameters and your, your area where something happens uh, on the part gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller, you will not be able to have a stable or reliable result. And so um, it was investigated how the laser um, power has to be adjusted to the angle of incidence. You can see this uh, in the diagram on the right hand side that there is a linear um, correlation between the angle of incidence and the required laser power. And using this, um, let me say, adjustment shown on the, in the orange line in the, in the graphics on the red, red, uh, right hand side, it was uh, possible to keep the overall roughness of the part in the area of 0 0.2 micrometers. After finding uh, this correlation, the next step was to check if the laser process um, influences the mechanical properties of the part. And therefore, uh, the ILT made some, some investigations. They uh, checked the microstructure of the part. They, they did some investigations uh, about the, the orientation of the microstructure and so on. And uh, the good news is uh, the laser polishing is not influencing the mechanical properties in a negative way. It's the opposite. You see these in the, the fourth uh, column, that the breaking elongation is significantly higher if you ex um, examine a laser polished part than in case of the part in S-built condition. Maybe that uh, the reason for this is uh, that the number of micro cracks on the surface is reduced, and so there are less initial points for cracking. And this is a, a quite uh, interesting result, and we are quite happy about this. To make this, uh, uh, let me say, process uh, happening, uh, this correlation between the laser power and the angle of incidence has been integrated in the so-called technology module. The technology module takes, for example, an initial NC program, defining the path of the um, laser uh, head, and then this specific laser polishing technology is added on top of this uh, information. And at the end, you will get a laser polishing program which can be used on a normal machine. In case of uh, the ILT, they have equipped a normal 5-axis milling machine with a laser head, and they can run the process over there. And it is astonishing to see the uh, demonstrator part over there that uh, steep walls 
inline uh, curvatures can be uh, polished with this and uh, we are happy about this result. You can see a three-stage model uh, over there showing the <coughs> spilled condition, showing the milled condition and showing the laser polished condition and um, I think it's a good, good result. The work uh, inside the work package was focused on Inconel 718 but uh, the findings and the strategy can be transferred to other materials. So if you are interested in polishing other materials, just let us know. As a summary, um, I would repeat uh, something David had said in his introduction this morning. Please don't look at all these process steps as in a separate way. Please don't look at the optimizing just for optimizing the part but at the end nobody is able to clamp it on the machine. Weight reduction is, uh, is a nice feature and it's uh, always mentioned as the main driver for additive manufacturing but perhaps you can add some small elements like shown here on the right hand side and the bottom which makes the referencing for the post-processing team much easier please think about marking the part. Place your markings not there where the post-processing team wants to clamp the part. Same for the support structures. We had some problems uh, handling the parts here uh, in the Amaze project because uh, in some build setups, the support structure were exactly placed where we would like to, to clamp the part. And if you remove these uh, support structures, there are some remaining peaks which represent uh, new uh, set surfaces so that the clamping is not, cannot be done properly. So if I could um, wish something, I would like to say, please sit together. The post-processor, the AM build specialist and the optimizing guy and then you will find a proper solution for all of these problems. And uh, another good idea, uh, what we have learned, was a successful integration of printed fixture elements. We use the printing system as well to uh, improve the fixture, which is also a nice idea in case of these bionic shaped parts. You can use a um, polymer printer to get all these jigs properly made and if you can integrate them in a, in a flexible structure then you are on the right way. But again, please don't think about these process steps as standalone process steps. You can waste a lot of money if your part is so complex that the, the fixture is nearly impossible to make. Maybe you can reduce the complexity of the part a little bit and make the life for the post-processor much easier. Of course, every time it depends on the number you want to produce. If you want to produce only one part, then the cost for the fixture doesn't matter, I think. But if you want to produce 1,000 parts, you have to um, work with a clever design fixture and uh, you have uh, to face other challenges. That's it from my side. In case we have uh, some questions uh, to the slides or to the software system I'll be available during the lunch break. I have the, sus the system here on my computer and I can show you how it works if you like. Any immediate questions or comments? Uh, I've just got a comment here. Um, so very short currently have um, a load of parts, a load of additive manufacturing parts uh, buzzing around Yeah. Um, the additive manufacturing part of it was really, really the hardest part of it, and the thing that we ended up running up against a whole lot of awful deadlines yeah. was the machining of the components. Yeah. So I can only reinforce what you've said here. Yeah. Um, you, you have to think very carefully when you're designing your parts and when you're designing your whole process to ensure that, uh, that this is taken into account. Yeah, thank you very much. My personal feeling is that um, two or three years ago, um, all the additive manufacturing guys were quite happy to see, oh, we can produce the part. Great. 
perfect, we did it. Now, three years later, we can rely on the processes and now we can uh, speak about serial production. We can look to the other process steps following the build to make uh, the, the additive manufacturing process efficient and quick and reliable. You can do this in that way. Um, in, in case of this uh, antenna support, the part was removed from the base plate uh, before because the big base plate uh, presented some other challenges uh, for, the, for the milling and drilling operations and for the accessibility, and, and so it was decided to remove it. You are, you are right. Um, I don't know uh, what's about the residual stresses, if uh, they are influencing uh, the part. Um, so it depends on, I think, on the part, which approach is better. We have seen this in, in one of uh, Stuart's slide before, that uh, NORSC uses the datum points when the part is still on the base plate. It's a good idea, but in, in other cases, maybe uh, a full-scale scan is also uh, um, a possible solution to overcome this. Thank you. Thank you.